Welcome, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. It's show number 27 here as we are approaching the end of year 2017. My name is Andrew Murata and proud host of Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Thrilled to be here this morning with you. We are on the following live stations. Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, Wall Radio out in the Middletown, New York area. On the following stations, 94.1, 94.9, 105.7, 106.1, 13.40 AM, and 101.5 HD2. And on 96.7 Pocono, 96.7 in the Stroudsburg area. Welcome, everyone, to the program. Excited uh, today to have on our guest coming up in the next segment is teacher and coach Dan Spanauer. Dan is doing great things in the North Carolina area, uh, coaching up those kids uh, in basketball and a PE teacher. But he's also doing some great work with the Coaching and Leadership Journal. Dan is an outstanding coach and uh, has this Coaching and Leadership Journal, which we're going to get into shortly. So let's get started here on the program. We have lots to cover, lots to get to. And as we are uh, in the holiday season, I do want to wish everyone well. It is a great time. And just remember, sometimes people get down during the holiday season. There's talk of depression and, and the bad things come out. You know, you make your own weather out there, so get into the season and uh, and, and, and the good spirits it's about giving, uh, so get into it. So we're going to get into it right now on the program. Again, this is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving, and my name is Andrew Murata, and my theme, my opening theme comes from the Coaching and Leadership Journal um, produced by Dan Spanauer, and the topic today is about presence. We're going to talk about the book, Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges, written by Amy Cuddy. And before we get to that, I'm here in the studio with my handy dandy producer, Gavin Burt. Gavin, today's topic is going to be about presence, and you're a radio guy. How does one have a presence on the radio, in your opinion? Well, some people, I think, have it more than others. I remember an announcer from upstate New York, I won't name, this was many years ago, who I probably would have fit in well at an easy listening station back in the day, but if you put him on anything more up-tempo, he just sounded out of place. So I think some people sometimes have it and sometimes people don't, but I think smiling when you're on the air helps. Uh, that just makes you sound more cheerful or you know upbeat, so to speak. Um, so I, I guess those are my answers um, how, how does a Staten Island accent play on radio? How does that go? <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to offend someone again. <laughs> there are probably radio or TV stations where you may not get work. I know that whenever I go south, it's rare that you find any TV newscaster who talks with an actual southern accent. So I think that's, to some extent, frowned upon. Well, we're going to go south today with our guest, Dan Spanauer. And if we have to do any translating with that southern accent, we will get to it. So let's get to today's topic. It was about presence. And again, um, Coach Dan Spanauer wrote about this in the Coaching and Leadership Journal, and it was adapted from a book written by Amy Cuddy, Presence, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges. And it was a great book. I actually ordered it, and uh, I, but I read it in the journal there. And Amy goes on to write that presence is when you are attuned to and are comfortable to access and express your best qualities, your boldest self, your core values, your skills, your knowledge, and your personality when you can do this in a stressful and meaningful situation, you will have great presence. That's easier said than done. Uh, And this concept resonated with me very much so in my role as a high school principal and in my role as a college basketball referee about having presence. And people talk about that so much, and, and, and really in those roles that I live in my life, uh, being, being in the spotlight, there's a lot of high expectations 
on me when I'm in those roles. I have to enforce the rules within those roles. And usually, in the outcome of my actions, somebody's not going to be happy. I have to make decisions there. And and when I do that, when I do the work in those roles, I have to show presence. So this topic and this book really identified with me. Uh, To my listeners out there, I'm not sure what your work is, but like Gavin even said, on the radio, you have to have a presence. So whatever your role is, even if you're not considered a leader in your job, you can have presence. So let's get into it. What uh, are some of the qualities that Amy Cuddy writes about in her book there uh, called Presence? So the number one thing is believability, being authentic being genuine and believing in yourselves. I recently had someone contact me after an interview. They didn't get the job and they said, hey, would you give me some pointers? And I spoke to the person about uh, believability and having more presence in their interview. Uh, They were kind of subdued a little bit, a little slouched in the chair, etc. The number uh, second uh, quality that uh, Amy Cuddy writes about, being confident not defensive, not cocky or arrogant. You can let your guard down, accept criticism, and you don't have to act as if you know all the answers. Number three, verbal and nonverbal behaviors should synchronize. So as I I mentioned earlier, my my accent is a Staten Island, New York accent. I'm also an Italian-American, so I use my hands a lot. You know, your nonverbal behaviors and your verbal talk should synchronize. Um, I have a big voice when I talk. Uh, This one is kind of easy for me. It kind of comes naturally. The last concept is believing in your own stories. Become a great storyteller. You know, facts tell, stories sell. So your believability, your presence, those are all things uh, that uh, that go a long way in telling great stories. And this is something that I work at and practice at, be, being a great storyteller. Uh, our friend Dr. Rob Gilbert uh, talks so much about that on his success hotline. And, you know, that, that can really add to what you're doing. So that's today's concept, talking about presence and bringing it in those situations. I remember... Um, and when I first started to referee, a veteran referee told me, you know, you have to dress and look the part. And, and I always remembered that and I actually included it in my book that I released this September called The Principle Surviving and Thriving about dressing and looking the part. When you walk into a room and you look sharp and you look good, you feel good and you act good. And then it all goes from there and, you know, you're going to be more confident So if you are trying to add those things to your game, to your life, uh, that is something uh, certainly that will help your presence. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you jotted some of those concept down. Uh, But I'm excited to get to our guest here coming up in the next segment, and that's Coach Dan Spanauer out of uh, Winston-Salem. More specifically, for you Southerners listening, King, North Carolina, is a suburb uh, outside of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So we will be right back on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show. This is show number 27, and I would like to welcome in today's guest to the show. It is His name is teacher and coach Dan Spanauer. He has been uh, teaching for 25-plus years at the high school level, at the college level. Uh, he is the oldest child of the Spanauer family there in King, North Carolina. He also is about 6'5 in height, but he has a nickname named Tiny. Dan, welcome to the program. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, I've been looking forward to this all week, and um, uh, all of us down here in North Carolina, you would be amazed at how many people are listening to your show. And uh, it's been really, it's really good, especially in the field that that I'm in. Uh, and the more that we can get leadership talked about, and especially in today's age, um, the better. So keep up the good work. I'm excited to be talking to you today. 
I appreciate it, Coach, and, and I'm sure you handle any of the translating uh, duties if they don't understand exactly what I say and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just uh, a diversity. So <laughs> anything, a little southern accent, nothing wrong with that. Nothing uh, wrong and, to and, it. Exactly. Well, we appreciate exactly. you tuning down in there in the King, North Carolina, Winston-Salem area. It is a beautiful area, Pilot Mountain Overlooks. And oh, yeah. uh, I certainly enjoyed my time there. But let's get to it, uh, Coach Spanauer. You know, you are a hoops guy in and out. It's in your blood. Tell me about that, Dan, and, and where did you develop that love of basketball and, and, and then eventually yeah. the coaching? Yeah, I think it was coaching first. Um, I, I always knew for some reason that I wanted to be a coach. And, and matter of fact, when I was 15, um, and, and you know my mom, Ch- affectionately called Chubby. But anyway, before I even had my driver's license, I was coaching youth teams. And um, she would have to drive me to the practice. And uh, I've always had this desire to be a coach. And, and then that has led me to the uh, to the basketball. And I was fortunate enough when I started out to get in with some good people at Bishop McGinnis, a Catholic school in Winston-Salem, um, and, and, which had a very well-established basketball program. So that led me toward the basketball but I was more of a um, I was more of wanting to be a coach than a basketball coach and then the basketball coach came from that desire okay and so it was an early age that you liked this and and then oh, yeah. with, with all that you're doing now you know tell me about the leadership component in your coaching tell me about the you know being a leader and, and teaching leadership in, in life yeah, that's a fascinating thing to me. That's that's what keeps me going is that that's one of the great things about coaching. It's it's not just about wins or losses. It's about lead, it's how do you reach different people. And it doesn't matter if it's on the college level or the high school level or like for our team right now, we we have an extremely young team. So the way we have to reach them is different than the team of last year where I had such an, a veteran team. And I think I I'm fascinated with leadership. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later, but that's to me that's what I'm called to do, and that's what I enjoy. And um, and the coaching is sort of the byproduct. And the and the older I've gotten, and the more I've done it, the more that I've seen that it's it, it is about you know leading leading and and leadership and getting the right people in the right place, and then teaching these kids valuable lessons as goes beyond the basketball floor. And Dan, you mentioned your your mom. Diane Spanauer, and, and, and again, your parents were such great role models for me. Uh, playing basketball at Guilford College, your parents only missed two games in four years, home and on the road. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and that dedication and that commitment to us, she always used to bring those um, little peanut peanut butter uh, chocolate the Peanut treats. butter. What, peanut butter call, delights. What would you call them? No, they had some weird the, name. The Mickey's. <laughs> Mickey's, yeah. <laughs> uh, up in New York, they call Mickey's drugs, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. well, they're sort of like a – they're addictive like a drug. They but were. Trust me, there's no drugs in it. Um, <laughs> Just a yeah. lot of love. But she still comes. Her, my, my mom and dad uh, – People may not know this, but I know he's been. My brother's been on your show, but he's the principal here at the school that I'm working at. And my mom and dad have not missed a game. I've been back from Florida. Um, this is my 11th year, and um, they've been to every game that I coach. And now I have nephews on the team, so they have grandkids on the team. But they're still sitting right there, following us around. They'll be there tomorrow, front and center. I love it. I love it. So, Dan, tell me about your relationship with your parents, that support, that guidance they gave you. Did that help build your foundation for the, the coach and the, and the man you are today? Oh, no question. Uh, from, my, from my mom, without question, I got, you know, the apathy, not apathy, but the sympathy that she has for other people. Um, She's the most caring. I, I tell people, my mom's the type of person that if she loved pie and there was one piece of pie left, she'd say she didn't like pie because mm. she wants everybody else to have it. Mm. And um, so I learned how to care from, about people from her. And then my dad taught me the value of hard work. My dad was a self-made businessman, and um, he, he didn't graduate from high school, but he's one, he was one of the smartest men I've ever known. And he taught me, and he ran his company. So I was, a, and I worked for him when I was 15, all the way until I was graduated college. So I got to see him and how he handled his men. 
and it was in a different environment. I mean, it was a construction type environment, grading company, uh, and some of the men that he was having to deal with were he'd have problems of them not showing up and he'd have to motivate them. And, uh, and I was able to see that and I could, and you know, my dad, he, his temperament is very quiet, very, you know, but he gets his point across. And and what happened, I think with my dad, with the, the people who work for him, which is what I try to do as a coach, I try to get it to where they want to do something for me that they don't want to let me down. And, and I think in today's day and age, even more so the, ba- the, you know, you can't just come in and be the, you know, whip them with a – going to tell them. It used to be you could tell a kid you're going to run, and they'd say how fast. Now you, you, you've you got to show the, the reason and show the love and everything else. And, and what the people did for my dad was they worked for my dad because they didn't want to let him down. And, and I definitely learned that, and I've tried to implement that into my coaching style. And we talked about presence in the opening uh, segment. Mm -hmm. You know, your father is is such a quiet leader. You know, I talked about the boisterous Italian household I grew up Mm -hmm. in. And then I came down there and it was just so different. And and your father was so reserved. But everything you said, 100 percent. Yeah, and I, I really like what you were saying. I was able to listen to what you were talking about, the presence and everything, and that is so true and, and with coaches and leaders and everything else. The, I think the important thing is that the presence doesn't have to be the same, and that's what I think people get in trouble a little bit is they try to have the presence of someone else. Uh, they have to be themselves, and if they're themselves and they've got passion about what they're doing, then the, pres- the presence will show through if they're quiet, if they're loud, or whatever style they have. Well, and it's been so nice to get to know you and your, and your brothers and your, your sister because you guys are really a, a complement of, of both your parents uh, with your with your styles. But Dan, I learned uh, that about this presence and about this book by Amy uh, Cuddy by reading the, your journal, the Coaching and Leadership Journal. Tell me about this uh, this Coaching and Leadership Journal, Dan. That what you're doing and h- how long you've been doing it and and how did you get started with this? Yeah, well. I started a company called the Leadership Publishing Team. I um, I left here in '03, here being West Oaks, where I am now, and went to Florida. And I had a year before I became director of basketball at Florida State, um, where I worked for Coach Hamilton. And in that year, I, it gave me a time to start writing some things. So I like writing. I put together some quote books and some other things. So I formed my own little company called the Leadership Publishing Team, and. Um, and one thing that's come out of that is this monthly journal. And the purpose of it is to give people what they need. I take my 34 years of experience and, and go through and curate and try to figure out what I think people would, would need in the athletic profession um, without a lot of fluff. You know, a lot of times we as coaches and leaders as well don't have time to read a big book and we don't have time to, to get everything. So I try to get you know, go through the internet, go through and write some stuff myself, and uh, and it's been really good. It started it started five years ago. I actually launched it in 2011. We got our first subscriber in 2012, right toward the end of 2012. And was, and her, was her name Diane Spinar? And it was not. <laughs> it's, uh, you know what? I can't get her to su- subscribe. Uh, she's, but, uh, t- she's tough. But man. it's been really good. And this past year, we've had you know we've had some along with. Um, Andrew Murata, we've had some other big names join us too, like Tubby Smith and Frank Martin and uh, Susie Merchant from Michigan State. And we've got Jerry York, who's the all time winning uh, men's hockey team from Boston College. And um, so we've got great, uh, a very good subscriber list, which tells me that it is, it's hitting a niche that people, people want that. It is, Dan. And, and, how would somebody, if they're listening today, uh, how would somebody subscribe to that or find uh, how to get the Coaching and Leadership Journal? Yeah, uh, leadershippublishingteam.com. Leadershippublishingteam.com. And, and all, you know, also, if they were to Google me, I'm sure it'll come up with that. But you can find it on that website. Um, and Dan, right where there. where do you how do you develop like this month in December? You had some cool stuff in there about uh, some of the Christmas movies out there, and you had some mm-hmm. you know sayings about you know giving during Christmas, and and then of course the the coaching and leadership articles. Where do you get your content for the journal? I spend 
all year, and I really do a lot of it in my off season when I'm not coaching, and um, and I really enjoy it. Yeah, I think, you know, and I was asking you before the show about you finding time for this, uh, finding time for this radio show, um, and I know that you're doing everything at your school and everything else, and and you said it, you know, you find time for for the things that you think is important, and um, that's what I do with this because I what it's done for me. I think it's made me a better leader because I research it, and particularly out of season. So when my when my season ends, I'll spend every day at least an hour or so going through articles. You know, I curate them and I read it and scan it and go through some books, and and that's where I get it from. And and it's what I think a coach or a leader in, um, would be relevant to them. So, and, and your point yeah, that's what I do. your point about that it's a quick read it is it, it, it it's a heavy yeah. duty it's a heavy duty thing so it's not going to get crinkled up and and destroyed uh but it it's not a big textbook and and literally wow. you could pick something out of it each and every day to make you better yeah i think that's why that's why um fortunately the people that it people are responding to it um uh, because it is like that i mean and the bottom line is you can find if you if you wanted to go on and google something on the internet you can find information but you spend so much time having to go through it and then a lot of it is junk and you don't know the if it's factual and everything else and and that that's the purpose of this um is to sort it out so that people who's in a leadership position that don't have time can read it and get something out of it well, and again, so this the, the concept of presence uh, in that book written by Amy yeah. Cuddy. I've ordered the book. I read it on your journal. I ordered the book. I watched the uh, the YouTube video, uh, the, her uh-huh. TED Talk, and uh, yeah. we're making contact with Amy to have her here on, on the show. So uh, Great. It's, it's, it's you know, Great. All, all from the journal. Well, you make sure she knows how where that contact came through. <laughs> Leadership Publishing Team. <laughs> This is Coach Dan, Dan Spanauer, everyone. We do need to take a break. We will be right back uh, with Coach Dan Spanauer where we're going to talk uh, literally more about his team and his college experience uh, here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. We are on WDLC, WYNY, Wall Radio and Pocono 96.7. Let's get back to it with show number 27 and our guest, Dan Spanauer. Uh, He's doing a great job today. Dan, you mentioned a a couple of the places that you had been uh, in the past, certainly spending uh, the time at Bishop McGinnis, uh, you know, over 13 years. You've been at West Oaks High School now uh, as the head coach, PE teacher, spent some time as the athletic director uh, but Dan, you also spent some time at, at some pretty high levels of college basketball, uh, being at in the Miami and Florida State basketball programs. Uh, tell us about yeah. your time uh, at both of those places, Dan. Yeah, I, um, I I got to work at University of Miami with I worked with Coach Leonard Hamilton. That was and it, the story is straight out of um, the Final Four stories of being in the lobby. If people have heard of that, I was in the lobby. And um, I was saying it was about time. I knew it was about time for me to try something else. And I had worked the Duke camp for years. And um, and I was talking to Tommy Amaker, and I was telling him what I was looking to do. And he said, "Well, Leonard, right over there is looking for somebody, and he can put you in graduate school." And I was I'd been in I'd been coaching then for 14 years. And um, anyway, one thing led to another. So I went to Miami for two and a half years, and it was great. And it was right when um, we made the first NCAA in 38 years and um it was it was it was really good um and then that was the first time I came back home because I didn't have anything there wasn't a spot opening up I would have had to stay there and this school that I'm at now was opening up and the superintendent contacted me about being the AD so I came back for the first stint and opened up the school um and, and as a matter of fact, I think we ran our first basketball camp here, and you were a counselor. Uh, it was right around that time, so we had we had a good solid foundation with with that. And then five years, let's see, in 2005, Leonard got one thing led to another, and they were need, he'd been at Florida State for a couple of years, 
and uh, they needed a director of basketball operations. And I went down there for a, a little over a year, and um, same type thing. And, and I enjoyed it, loved it, uh, but I wasn't really getting to coach, and there wasn't really, you know, it was more of an administrative thing. But I wouldn't trade that time for anything, uh, and I'm forever grateful to Coach Hamilton for the opportunities he's given me. And and Dan, you know, you mentioned that you, you weren't able to coach, but you were at, you know, big time college basketball yep. programs, you know, and in big cities, you know, what was that like to be at that level? Um, and, and, you know, what was the best thing about being at the, that level? Uh, the best thing was seeing how it's done, I think. And, and, and just, you know, we all like to be in that, you know, we, as coaches, young coaches, that's some like, I always had a dream. I wanted to be on the bench at two places. I wanted to be in the bench, you know, and I'm, I'm a big believer in this, you know, thoughts become things and all this stuff. And and a thing that I always said that I wanted to do when I wanted to coach is I wanted to I wanted to be on the bench at Madison Square Garden and I wanted to be in the bench at Cameron. And um uh, because of that I was able to do that. When Miami when I was at Miami it was in the Big East. So we had the tournament up at up in your neck of the woods mm-hmm. and uh and that was a thrill. And and then of course being in Cameron and going through the A C C is something being a local boy from here was something that was so big. So so that, you know, the big time of the the athletics was the biggest thing, um, you know, but there's also a big difference. Once you get past all that, you start to realize that coaching is coaching, whether it's high school or, or whatever level it's at. And then, you know, I wrote in my notes here, you know, it was like a country song, and, and you got yeah. to go from King, North Carolina, to some of those big cities. Yeah. And, and you mentioned about the first – reason to come home and you talked about the second reason home you know but was there something about king north carolina that was drawing you home as well you know i think i think you you, i think you move forward with faith and if you do that the dots that you look back and you see that the dots connected i think we get in trouble when we try to connect the dots beforehand we try to force this for there's no way i could have planned this when I was at Florida State, it just so happened, and and I'd left for a year, and it just so happened that the uh, head coach here resigned, and the athletic director called, contacted me because I was looking. We were actually looking at the possibility of going to um, uh, UAB. I mean, because I, I, I wanted to coach, sure, and, and I was looking at the possibility of that, and um, the athletic director called me for recommendations, and I said, well. I may have someone in mind, <laughs> and uh, so that's. And, and then, as it's worked out, I've been able to be back. And now, since I've come back, Kevin, my brother, has become the principal. Who he wasn't here at that time. I've been able to coach my nephews, and and uh, you know, I'm a big believer. And there's a bigger picture, and and we have to do our part. So when that, when you start feeling, when you start seeing things lining up and it feels right, regardless of what level you're on, I think you've got to take it. Because I've often asked myself, well, what if I would have just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay and I'm going to try to do UAB or someplace? And uh, I don't think it would have, you know, I think I was supposed to be here right now. And you, you, you just answered my next question, and that was a great explanation, you know, because there's that song out there, you know, what might have been, you know, and you right. sound confident in the decisions you make. The, mm-hmm. Dan, the question I was going to ask you, and, and you kind of explained it in your, in your, in your, the way like your father would, you know, how did you know it was the right time, or how did you know it was the right time to leave Bishop McGinnis or, or, or not take that UAB, you know, uh, yeah. in your career? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I th- one I think you one I think you have to know yourself before the decision making comes. You know, uh so I'm a I'm a big believer and I've tried to do this for a long time now is to spend quiet time with myself every day and it may sound cheesy, it may sound all this. You know, but if you could take time to listen to yourself and and, and see which way you're feeling, uh it's, it can guide you in the right direction. So when that when that first thing comes, and if it feels right, if you're not careful, you can talk yourself out of it. You know. So what I've tried to do is follow intuition or follow follow the feeling of what feels like it's the right way to go. Now you know you know sometimes maybe it doesn't go exactly as it does, but 
you know, again, I'm, I think that whole thing about I heard somebody say that that's not mine about connecting the dots later. But it's true because we can all look back. You can look back at how you met your spouse. You can look back at this and that. And all those dots connected. And there's no way we could have placed them like that. So when things start to happen, signs start to come, you start getting a feeling, and then all of a sudden a phone call comes or something like that, I think that's a sign that maybe you need to look into that. And I remember uh, when I was in college wanting it to move down there and Again, the dots connected, and I didn't move there, and I wound up moving away from New York City up to uh, mm-hmm. the Milford, uh, Pennsylvania area, and, and it was the right decision because I needed to be yeah. closer to my family, right. but still happy to have yeah. my, my connection with the span hours. I hear you, and I think it's important not to uh, not to think that at a certain age they just stop things stop moving you know we got to keep growing that's what i'm trying to do i you know i i hear people talk about oh they want to retire you know like i've been in it 34 years and uh you know maybe you want to evolve that's what i uh, that's what i say evolve into new things and you talk about what i'm trying to do with my journal and my business that's what i'm trying to do is is evolve into something else and then when, as you evolve new experiences happen and where do you see the journal going, uh, Dan? You you uh, mentioned some of the you know you have major Division One coaches subscribing to that. You know where do you see it going? I I would like to get to where it's in every um, athletic program uh, at the collegiate level, and including high schools. I also have some high school uh, uh, subscribers as well. Um, that's what I would like to do. Uh, and as long as I enjoy writing it, and, and, and like I said, it's useful for me. It's a resource for me because every month I am, um, I'm reading, I'm learning, and, and, and going through things. And like you said with your book that Amy Cuddy, I'd, before I started researching some things, I really wasn't aware of that. So uh, I, I would like to see it. I'd like to see it continue to grow, uh, and I would like to see my uh, passion for it to continue to grow too. Well, and again, if we could help you here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, uh, we'd be happy to do that. His journal is well, you, found. You, you've done that. <laughs> hey, you've done that. But I appreciate this. We're yes. going to bring it up Same to here. Orange County. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> might have to have I'll you. Handle, co- I'll hand deliver. That's right. We might have to have <laughs> you come up and uh, do some appearances for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dan, you mentioned, uh, again, you've been teaching 34 years um, in coaching. You know, you have you have so much experience. You come from such a great family. You touched upon today's athlete. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear people that have been doing it a long time that they don't adapt and they don't, they don't make changes. And you mentioned a little bit about how you might have treated the kid 20 years ago differently. You know, yeah. t- tell me what it's like coaching, you know, today's generation in terms of motivation and, and getting these kids uh, going? Yeah, I, I think, f- first of all, no matter what uh, field you're in, you do have to adapt and you do have to evolve. And the ones that don't evolve will get left by the – and you can look – they'll get left by the wayside. And you can look at any coach, you know, you look at Coach K or anyone like that, you can see that they have evolved and they're not the same coach. Um, to me, the biggest difference for me – uh, that we're deal that we have to deal with. We're 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 in an age of specialization, where kids are. We got a culture of individual work and personal training, and there's more emphasis on the individual than ever before, which creates a sense of entitlement. And, and particularly at the high school level, but I think the college level, anything. One of the hardest things is t- is teaching kids how to be a good teammate, and and bringing a team together, and. Um, that to me is the biggest challenge, and I, that's the part that I like. Uh, but it, it's different. It's not necessarily bad, uh, but it's different. There's a, you know there's a lot more there's a lot more positive going on, but uh, it's not necessarily bad. Do you find yourself losing your patience a little more often with with some of the things you just talked about about the the focus on oneself and the individuality that kind of stuff? You know, it's funny. I think with age, you, you uh, for me, I'm maybe I'm, I might even become more patient. Um, I think I think with us, 
whatever you're coaching, you've got to have certain standards of, of non-negotiables. Like there's certain things I'm not going to let slide, like bad body language and like not looking at me in the eye and everything else like that. And that's been there, and that's going to always be there. Uh, so with that, I'm just I'm I'm not going to have a lot of patience for. But understanding that kids don't know how to be teammates, understanding that kids answer, you know, they transfer a lot and they want to transfer. I mean, that's a culture that's been created. And and, and to get frustrated and lose patience because of the culture, uh, I think you only – I have a saying, don't ever take it out on the coach, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm the one that's got to go home and stay healthy. Um, uh, but the culture has changed, you know, and I think you have to be aware. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with the journal. You have to be aware of what the culture is and then try to get it to change within the culture. I love it, Dan. Great answer. Gavin Burt wants to jump in here. Go ahead, Gavin. I'm 37, and as I have aged, I have gotten less patient. Just wanted to add that there. <laughs> Maybe in certain things. <laughs> Could be, like but, working in radio. Yeah. yeah. But, hey, definitely if you're working with, with uh, high school kids, you, you're going to have to be more patient uh, <laughs> because they're in a – they want to know why now. And if it's just like, I remember when I started out, you'd say run, and they'd run through the wall if you had to. You know, That's right. That doesn't, that's not the same motivation these days. Dan, we are up to a fan favorite part of the show. Uh, this has become a staple uh, on the program. It's called the rapid fire portion, uh, and, and we want to get to know you a little bit better. So uh, if you need to elaborate a little bit, I'm going to give you that freedom. But these are quick what comes to your mind uh, uh, as fast as, as you can, okay? You, okay. You ready? And if, I, and if I draw a blank, it's okay. We go next. Get, I, get, can hit, I can hit the buzzer yeah, and go next. Yeah, Ga- Gavin's going to edit the buttons. He edited out my curses and my ums and ahs. <laughs> he, he'll take care of you. All right, here we go. Last book you read. Uh, In Tune with the Infinite by what Ralph Waldo Trine. It's an old one. I just finished, as a matter of fact, and it's about – it's about the power of positive things. It's a book that um, Henry Ford bought and gave it to all of his people. It's, wow. it's got a little new agey stuff, but it was written in the 1800s, and uh, it's a really good book. You're telling and, uh, me there's another there's another Ralph Waldo somebody? I thought there yeah. was only one Ralph Waldo. Emerson. Yeah, there's another. Trine. <laughs> T-R-I-N-E. And the name of the book? Check it out. Check it out. What's the it's name? A, it's in tune, it, in tune with the Infinite. Now, it's got a little new agey stuff because it gets into the thinking and stuff. But, uh, I like it. But it tells you about positive thinking and that type of stuff. And I did. I just finished it. Last, last movie last you last saw. Night. I haven't seen many movies. Um, it's basketball tell you season. Tell what I did. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't see. I haven't really seen any movies. Sorry about that. Okay. We're taking a pass. Last yeah, use, pass. Last useful professional development that you took part in. Uh, we do a little round table down at North Carolina Wesleyan every year, a bunch of coaches and leaders, and we, we just sit around and talk basketball and talk leadership, and it's really good. And I really like those type of developments as opposed to a clinic. I spoke at, a, I spoke at our state clinic this, um, this summer, which was good, but when you can just get in a round table and just throw off ideas, I really like that. Coach John Thompson. Yes. 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 Yeah. That's, yes. You, yeah. That's we, right. I forgot, that's I forgot right. that dot. Well, that's all right. I forgot to connect that dot. Coach. That's right. Well, John Thompson does this, and we have some good stuff and good people coming in. We have coaches from all over. Yeah, yeah exactly. Coach T was our Get assistant coach at, uh, at Guilford College. Yeah, we'll have to reach out to him. Uh, biggest, yeah. Biggest, yeah. biggest pet He's peeve good. of your coach, uh, biggest pet peeve of yours as a coach and teacher? Uh, entitlement, putting putting themselves above the team. Um, but again, I, like I said, I think you've got to understand that that is a, a nature of the culture these days. So you have to teach them how to change it. Biggest pet peeve about refereeing? Um, when the referee thinks they're bigger than the game, uh, not carrying on conversation. And high school level, a lot of times that's the case. You want to talk about a difference that I saw between college and high school? The officiating was much more professional. Uh, not, you know, they would carry on conversation. Uh, they, I think they understood both people that was there to have a job to do. And uh, yeah, that gets me when I can't even ask a question. I like it. How is it working uh, in a school where your brother is your super, your younger brother is your supervisor as principal? Who I actually coached. Who you I actually coached. coached. 
Yeah, I coached Kevin at Bishop McGinnis. Yeah, and uh, and now he is my boss, which uh, it, but it's good. I mean, you know, we joke about it. You know, all those sprints I made him run. He's now it's affecting my evaluation, but it's not true. He he's really good. He's been on your show. Uh, too, and you both you guys are fantastic leaders. For Kevin, Kevin, Kevin gets it, and I'm not just saying that because it's my brother, but but uh, he he does a good job running a school. Who nicknamed you Tiny? It happened in college. Um, I grew probably my first year of college. I was short. I wasn't very big, and then I grew, and then all of a sudden, some I was standing somewhere, and they go. You look like that you're t- – I don't know. They called me Tiny. And David, my brother, was standing there. And uh, from that point on, been Tiny. Everybody in our family basically has a nickname. So that one stuck. <laughs> and uh, I know when someone calls me Tiny, it comes from the past. Oh, yeah. <laughs> La- last purchase under $100 that has had the biggest impact on your life. Uh that's a tough one. Mm-hmm. That's I'd, I'd pass. He's taking a pass. Gavin will give him the pass. Uh, <laughs> this is a hard one. The question I didn't ask you today that I should have. The question you didn't ask me that you sh- that you should have. Um, that is a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, how are we going to uh, get you back down here to North Carolina mm-hmm. for one of these uh, Christmas dinners or, or some of these uh, peanut butter delights? Uh, I th- that's, right. uh, that's an we excellent to, question. <laughs> we have to. We got to figure. You're, you're, you're so used to show up all the time. Well, you know? we're being down there. I remember coming home one day from somewhere, and there was a car parked out there with, uh, with New York. I mean, not with New York tags, with our tags. And I'm like, where did this come from? And it's Andrew Maradas. You'd be at the house more than I was. That was a great, a great story with your father negotiating down the price of that uh, that car. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like he bought him a car. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, we got to take a, another break. Uh, we're approaching the end of the show, but uh, we're going to take uh, one more break here on education, leadership, and beyond surviving and thriving. With today's guest, we'll be right back with Dan Spinow. Welcome back, everyone, to Education, Leadership, and Beyond Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show, and this has been a fantastic. Show number 27 with my guest, Coach Dan Spanauer, out of King, North Carolina. We'll bring Dan back in in a moment. A quick recap of the opening segment. We talked to Dan about uh, his journal, the Coaching and Leadership Journal, where you can find at uh, the coaching, oh, sorry, I misspoke there, the leadership publishing team.com. Uh, it's a great resource for all leaders, coaches, and teachers. We talked about presence and the book written by Amy Cuddy, Bringing Your Boldest Self to Your Biggest Challenges, and the four qualities she writes about in the book uh, on presence believability. Being genuine and authentic. Number two, being confident. Number three, your verbal and nonverbal behavior should be in uh, synchronization. They should synchronize. And number four, be a great storyteller and believe in your own stories. I want to welcome back in Coach Spanauer. He told some great stories today of his journey uh, as a teacher and coach. And, and Dan, we really appreciate you uh, being on the program. I've enjoyed it. It went fast. Thanks for having me. It does go fast. Um, But, Dan, this is the write-in portion of the show. Uh, People can write in uh, Andrew at NeverSyncMediaGroup.com. They can leave comments on AndrewMarada.com or shoot a question on Twitter at Andrew Murata 21 and Dan today's uh, coach uh, today's coach sorry today's question uh, is for you Dan and as a parent what advice would you give to best support their child uh, while playing athletics it doesn't necessarily have to be basketball but what would you tell yeah. a parent to best support their child uh, in athletics I think the key word support um, I think we've got a lot of parents that have because of um, youth sports and everything else that have gone from the parenting role to the coaching role. 
and uh, if they can support and uh, let them have fun and, and let the coaches coach and, and, and them be supporters, I think that's the best thing they could do. And, Dan, you mentioned about earlier, you know, don't blame the coach. Do you get that a lot, that parents are coming at you about playing time or kind of blaming you almost for – yeah, fortunately, fortunately, not so much. Maybe because I've been doing it for a while. But we we really hit on that. We talk to our kids all the time about loyalty, and 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 we we let them know, and we tell the parents we understand that you love your child, and and you want them the the very best for them. But you've got to trust me as a coach, and you've got to trust that we're building a team. And, and, you know, you cannot – a kid can only listen to so much. And uh, he can't be hearing one thing from us and another thing from them. And it goes to part what we were talking about earlier, that one of the biggest challenges today is, crea- is, is teaching kids how to be good teammates. And, um, and that's bigger than basketball, you know. And, and we try to teach the parents that too. Support them um, and then support them in whatever role they end up in. And um, as opposed to thinking they've got to take every shot or something like that. Do you bring the parents in, Dan, when you before the season? Do you have a parent meeting? We have parents meetings. There are parent meetings that take place, and also there are, uh, we we have a meeting where we lay everything out to the kids themselves, and we talk about loyalty. We have them fill out a questionnaire uh, that these things are addressed. Can you play if you never play? Are you willing to do that? And uh, so we have it in writing, too. Um, but we're real, really big on teaching loyalty. Um, which, And if a parent can support – like well, I think one of the best things a parent can do is support a kid who doesn't play very much and say, you're doing a great job in that role. That team needs you. Uh, but, you know, sometimes egos get in the way and it's harder for them to do that. Dan, I told the story a couple of weeks ago on the program. Uh, my dad drove down from Staten Island, New York, to see our game in Randolph-Macon, Virginia. Uh-huh. And uh, I did not get in the game, and I didn't know my dad was coming. And I was uh-huh. so embarrassed that he drove uh-huh. all the way there from, from New York and, and drove back that night to go to work the next morning. And, and uh, uh-huh. I just remember what he said to me after he commits with your parents a little bit. Uh, but he uh-huh. said, Andrew, it, it, I didn't come here to watch you play. I came here to see you, and it's okay you didn't it, play. You know? Excellent. He came there to support you. That's right. That's right. And that's, that's it. Uh, if parents should support their kid in athletics, and, and that's the best thing they can do. Well, the absolute best thing. And there, your parents are still supporting you coming to the uh, the game. Still bar. supporting. Dan, still I got supporting. one last question before we let you go, and uh, I got about 30 seconds here on the program. If someone is wanting to start coaching uh, in college and or high school, Dan, I don't know if they're different, but if someone wants to get coaching, where, where would be the best place for them to get started? Yeah, I think if they want to do college, I would strongly suggest that they try to go the manager route or do something where they can go volunteer. Back in the old old days, there was a link from high school coaches to college coaches. As you can see now, that's not happening very much. Uh, the It's people who get in, they're a manager or they're a volunteer staff or something, and they get on the staff. That's what I would say if you wanted to do college. If you wanted to do high school, Learn the game as much as you can. There's enough. There, there will always be a demand for quality people that's willing to to be coaches. Great stuff, Coach Dan Spanauer. Again, the Coaching and Leadership Journal. Really appreciate you being on, Dan. We're out of time, but we do have a quote to end the program, and that's a quote uh, for you and your team. And uh, I know you're off to a, a successful start here. Uh, and the quote is, it might not be the best team that wins all of the time. It is the team that plays best that wins. So that is for you and your team, Dan. We wish you a a great season. Next week's guest uh, is coming up, Matt Williamson. He is a a student at Cal Poly Technical University out in California. He happens to be the son of the owners here of the Never Sick Media Group, Julie and Bud Williamson. So that's next week here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Matt Williamson. Dan, have a great season. All the best to you and your family. Thank you, Andrew. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate you having me on. All right. That is all, everyone. Go out and change the world for the better. Signing off here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond.